Okay, I'm gonna do something this morning that I've never done before. I'm gonna piggyback a sermon from last week. Last week we had Dr. Tim Elmore here, and his sermon was entitled, Rivers and Floods. Well, I'm gonna piggyback that. I think we're going to camp out on this flood river concept for one more Sunday to see if we can't better internalize that message into our own life. We're in Philippians chapter one. We're gonna look at verse six, 12, 18, and 21. So let's look at verse six to begin with. It says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That is to say, you and I are in a process whether we re realize it or not. As we saw in the video, a story preceded us and we're working out the details of that story in our own life. We are called to be active participants in that story. God is doing something or desires to do something in your life from the beginning of your life to the end that is a sanctifying process. God is trying to help you grow and mature in your knowledge of him. You're in some part of that process, we hope. So life and growth are processes. And in life, in that process, we experience two things. We experience rivers and we experience floods. We experience rivers and we experience floods. Inevitably, we experience both. Now, how do we deal with them? Let's talk about rivers, we'll recap. Rivers provide and exist because of boundaries. If you have no boundaries in your life, you have no river. You have what's called a flood. Rivers exist for direction and movement. A river will take you from point A to point B within the defined boundaries that exist. A river has purpose and mission. A river is a source of great power. And you know that if you try to swim upstream. Anybody trying to swim upstream? Oh my word. Rivers have great power, they generate power. They, have, they inherently have power. And rivers are consistently and dependently there for you. And rivers are a source of purity. I'd much rather drink water out of a river that is flowing than a flood that is not. There is a purity to river. So is your active story in life a river? Do you have boundaries, do you have direction, do you have purpose, do you have power? I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Do you have power in your life? And are you living in some realm of purity and movement, and vibrancy in life? Now let's talk about floods. Floods are, in a contrasting way, sprawling, without boundaries. Floods are destructive. Floods are typically shallow, and increasingly shallow as time goes on. And floods, no doubt, if you've ever been in one, are messy. Floods are stinky and moldy. They leave behind a mess that cannot easily be cleaned up. Floods are temporary, and we're called to be people that are consistently persistent but a flood can be very useful. And that's something we need to think about this morning. If rivers are inevitable in life and floods are inevitable, how do we leverage a flood? How do we get the most we can possibly get out of a flood to help us continue on in this process of growing and maturing as men and women and followers of Christ? Floods are necessary at times for change. Floods are necessary for growth, sometimes, Floods are necessary because we're in need of testing. We're in need of reevaluating. We're in need of moving upward. What's the first thing you do when your house gets flooded? You move to the second floor. Floods cause us to move upward in direction, and to that extent, they can be good. And floods are, as I said earlier, inevitable. All right, so we all, as human beings, are going to experience flow, direction, purpose, and boundaries, but we're also going to experience at times, sometimes by our own doing, and sometimes by God allowing these floods to happen, we're gonna experience quite the opposite. The absence of boundaries, the presence of a mess, a stinky mess, I might add. So now we go on to Philippians 1 and 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, 
that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Okay, here's Paul in a flood, we call it prison, the tail end of the uh, forum there in Rome, about 200 yards from the Colosseum is the Mamertine prison. There he sits, lowered down through a hole in a very musty, dank prison cell where there is no prison uniform, nor, no prison food, no prison clothing, no heater, no air conditioning, no candles, no pens, no paper. If you're gonna write something, you're gonna see something, you're gonna taste something, you're gonna get warmed by something, it's because some friend brought it to you. There is no prison system in Rome that cares for your needs. You are 110% dependent upon your buddy bringing you something. So every prison letter written in this dungeon was written because someone brought him a candle, because someone brought him something to eat. And you see this in his letters. We don't read these parts of the letters because they're the last tail end in the last chapter. But thank you, Erastus, my personal assistant, who brought me the candle, who brought me the food, who brought me the clothing. It's a common group effort. So in that prison, he says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Well, I like that. If floods are inevitable, they can actually help us advance. Verse 18, but what does it matter? I love this. What does it matter? I'm in a flood. I'm in a prison, I'm confined. Common day terms, I'm on the verge of bankruptcy, I'm gonna lose my house, I just got a bad diagnosis, but what does it matter? As we said last week, we're not denying the reality, but we're also putting that reality in perspective. What does it matter, really? What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. If you know what your river is, and you know what the definition of that river is, and what the boundaries of that river is, then when some flood comes about, you're gonna say this, what does it matter? I'm gonna flow through it, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna get over it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see it for what it is, I'm not gonna be overwhelmed by it, God is bigger than it, we just sang about that. God is stronger than that, God is more, uh, pertinent in my mind to the flood. We're gonna fix on him. We're gonna, we're gonna, whatever you focus on in life will enlarge, friend. You focus on your problem, it's gonna get bigger. You focus on God, he will get bigger in your life. Whatever you focus on will enlarge. And he says, what does it matter? I'm not gonna allow this flood to so distract me from what I know my purpose and mission is. And then he says it all, one of the coolest statements ever written. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. His whole life is brought into perspective with that statement. Even if he died, it'd still be all right. It's a no-lose proposition when you have a personal relationship with Christ. What does it matter? That's why when people are being persecuted around the world, I understand the gravity and how horrific that is. Trust me, I can only imagine what that's like. But at the end of the day, what does it matter? We're all gonna die anyway and we're threatening people around the world right now with what? We're threatening believers with heaven. What, at the end of the day, we overcome even death, hell, and the grave. This is amazing, this is a no-lose proposition. What does it matter? All right, now, speaking of floods, this is worthy of some attention. Some floods, this will surprise you, are the result of prayer. What? Yeah. They can be. Have you prayed for rain? Have you prayed for abundance? Have you prayed for financial blessing? Was that prayer answered? Now, in the answer to that prayer, do you now have a flood on your hands? It's in a men's group Tuesday morning. The gentleman was talking about the, all the businesses and the developments he had at one time. 14 projects going on at one time. That is a massive flood. That is an overwhelming flood. That is an all-encompassing flood. That is an exhausting flood. He, he, his prayers had been answered and he, and he lacked the ability to navigate and manage the abundance that he had. He had prayed for a flood and got one. When you say, Lord, help me grow, don't be surprised if you end up with a flood. Opportunity upon opportunity for growth. And they're not always fun. Lord, help me know. 
Sometimes the things that we learn in life are the result of experience, and some lessons learned are only the result of a challenging experience we call a flood. As I said, floods are inevitable. Lord, help me help others. Sometimes the empathy and the compassion that we need in life to genuinely, empathetically care and compassionately be loving to other people comes from an experience of a flood ourselves. Sometimes the best testimony to help someone in trouble is the person who overcame cancer. The best testimony is the person that did have an abortion. She can speak to the woman who's considering one. Sometimes the floods we have in our life must be leveraged later in life for the purpose of glorifying God. That's why floods are inevitable. The Apostle Paul had a walking flood, a thorn in the flesh. It was with him all the time because apparently it was necessary. If you want heaven on earth, you're reading the wrong book. It doesn't exist. In fact, we're promised, frankly, the opposite. Lord, help me to help others is often associated with some element of pain. Floods can also be the result of sin. Oh gosh, don't, don't some of us know that? I do. Floods can be the result of sin. Dr. Elmore talked about how we curse our floods and how we nurse our floods and how we rehearse our floods. Well, those first three are really pertinent points for us to ponder, are they not? We're called to reverse our floods. What does the word reverse really mean? Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first thing Jesus had to say about the entire three-year ministry, repent. Turn, reverse, reverse order, reverse direction, reverse mindset, reverse, reverse your paradigm, reverse your cultural paradigm, reverse your theological paradigm, reverse what you know and turn and go in the other direction towards Christ himself. Sometimes the sin that we have in our life, the poor decisions, the lack of wisdom, the overwhelming debt, the, the stupid mistakes that we make in life cause us an absence of boundaries, an absence of direction, an absence of pers- purpose, or a thwarting of direct direction and an absence of power, and we feel immobilized in a moldy, stinky, receding flood, stuck in our own self-induced mud. And we must reverse that. The only way to reverse certain floods is to repent, to genuinely own, personally take responsibility for. There's two words you don't hear in this culture, personal responsibility in the same sentence. Personal responsibility, remember that? It's a thing they had in the 50s. Personal responsibility, owning something and saying yes, That is my mistake, I own that. Yes, I embrace the stupidity of my decision. It is mine and mine alone. I won't rationalize it, I won't accuse someone, I won't project it on someone else. I will personally own that and I'm gonna turn from it in the midst of my three foot flood and I'm gonna go the other direction. That right there, my friend, was some halfway decent preaching. All right, so what do we do when we get in a flood? Well, that's the title of this message. We need a flood light. Psalm 119, verse 105. The word of God, here you go, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How is it that we shine the light in our flood and figure out what it is we can do? There's three things you can do in a flood. The first one is look in. Second one is look out. And the third is look up. Let's take it one at a time. Looking in. Looking inward during a, during a flood. If you're in a flood right now, you're in a squivet, you're in a bind, you're not going anywhere. It's all you can do, you keep your head above water. You're treading water. You're running to the attic of your home. That's, that's you. Is there something that you need to learn? This is a good question because the quicker we figure out what that is, the quicker the water recedes. Is there something we need to learn? Hmm. Am I measuring the wrong thing? 
Am I, am I having to reevaluate my priorities? Have I made something a priority that shouldn't be, and as a result, it's gotten bigger, and I'm standing in the middle of it. I can't seem to get out. Do I need, I know the answer to this question, do I need to learn how to wait? For any human being born in the United States of America, the answer is probably yes. Who was, somebody said this the other day, it caught my attention, I forget, I've been so many places. Do you find yourself pacing back and forth when something's in the microwave? <laughs> Fast food, do you expect the food to be at the window when you arrive? And this is crazy, I remember. Fast food is not near fast as it should be. What happened? They get really slowed down. Should I have seen this coming? Should I have seen this coming? Here's another one. Were there any warnings? You're headed the wrong way. You're headed the wrong way. Was I adequately prepared? These are questions worth action. Actually answering and thinking about if you're in the midst of a cumbersome, non-directional, exhausting, muddy water that smells, some circumstance in your life you can't seem to shake and get out of. Was I adequately prepared for this? Now own all of those answers, and there probably are other questions. Ask yourself, you'll figure them out. Now, what do we do also on the flood? We look out. Looking outward during the flood. Is this a means to advance the gospel? Is this a means to bring my ministry to another level? Is this a means to get me to look off of myself to other people? Is this some sort of tool that's gonna cause me to get out of myself and look at the world around me? Am I a me monster? Am I at the center of my own universe? Am I looking out for my neighbor? In a flood, when you get up to the second floor and the first floor is flooded and you look out the window, are you looking at how your neighbor's doing? Are you thinking about who you're going to help? Floods will help you to do that. Is there something that I have that I cherish that I can share with someone else? Floods will break selfishness in half like a twig. And this is, a good, this is a good thing that happens when there's a horrible natural disaster. The church rises to an occasion, the Red Cross shows up, we begin to look out for our fellow man, and you hear all the testimonies of sacrifice or people who loaded up their tools and drove 12 hours to help rebuild a city. Floods do that, they get us out of ourself. Maybe you're in one for that revelation, in part. And then you ask yourself this question, who around me can't swim? because they need me, they need my help. So you look in, you look out, and then you look up in a flood. Looking upward during and after a flood, is there higher ground I need to seek? Evaluate for a moment, friend, as I do myself. How often am I on higher ground, regardless of whether there's a flood or not? How much of my time Am I spent at a higher place of thought? I call it the transcendent life. When you transcend bickering and complaining and immaturity and whininess, when you're just in the word with the Lord and all that other stuff, the light shines on it and you see it for what it really is. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Higher ground, floods will take us to higher ground. If you haven't been to higher ground in a while, I trust and I hope it's not gonna take a flood to get you to move upstairs, to spend some time with the Lord. Okay, I got two, two, uh, I got two uh, verses I wanna show you. Well, the same verse in two different ways. Is the enemy in charge of floods? What's the deal with the enemy and floods? What's his role? All right, here's a uh, verse, you've read this before. Isaiah 59 and 19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, comma, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Now these Hebrew people, I wish I had taken English 101 back in, he in Old Testament days, you didn't use commas. 
Wouldn't that be great when you're in school and there's no commas? Now let's look at that verse. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, in other words, the enemy's coming in like a flood, stop thought. Once that happens, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Most publishers print this verse with that comma after the word flood, and they attribute the flood to the enemy. Now, let's look at the next one. When the enemy shall come in, comma, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. I like that version better. I like the Lord being in charge of the flood that sets up a standard against the enemy. I don't like giving the enemy the credit that he came up with the flood to begin with. That is to say, the spirit of God can be in charge of putting up boundaries against the enemy in my life. And he puts up floods to thwart the enemy from hurting us, oppressing us. I'll charge the Holy Spirit with the floods. I'll charge him with allowing the floods that we've created in our life to actually happen. I'll allow him to convict us of our manufacturing of the floods in our life. I'll actually give him the credit for actually creating the flood that keeps the enemy from me. I'm much better at trusting him for that than thinking I'm gonna e easily be overwhelmed by some sort of enemy-ridden, induced flood. I think Isaiah was saying that the spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard against him and he does it in the form of the flood. That's my choice. All right, let's talk about this word flow. What's everyone here, I want everyone here to say the word flow. Let's say it, flow. Say it again, flow. Flow is huge. Flow is one of the most important words in the Bible. I would say one of the single most important words of the Bible is flow, F-L-O-W, I'm not kidding. And I would also say, not always the best understood. Jesus is in uh, John chapter seven, verse 38, and he's speaking to them, and he says, uh, he says, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, let me say that again, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. Rivers of living water will flow from within him. What scripture? Had to be the Old Testament, right? Ezekiel 47. He has a vision of a little trickle of water coming out the south end of the temple. Just a little drops into the desert where there's no life. And the, and the water and the current begin to increase in Ezekiel 47. And, and the water so increases into a flow of water from beneath the temple in Ezekiel's vision, from, from Englium to En Gedi, the place of the deer, from two cities, and this water starts to meander and move its way through the desert, a place of death, and fishermen show up and begin to cast their lines into the river and yank out massive fish where there was once sand in this vision. Plants and fauna start to grow up around this riverbed now flowing with water. And Jesus is saying, as Ezekiel had a vision of this very water coming from the temple, he says, out of you will flow rivers of living water. That is to say, what comes out of you will be life-giving, life-transformative, nourishment for people. If you want the power of God in your life, know this, the power of God only enters an area where it has a way out. Power in, power out. Never power in, power in. Power in, power out. It's like electricity. God must have a way out of you in your life. If you have an absence of power of the Spirit of God in your life, there is an absence of an exit in your life for that power in the form of prayer, giving, love, sharing, generosity, empathy. God gives you power for the purpose of moving through you into someone else's life. Now, I have the luxury of talking about this subject in a way that most ministers do not. And I enjoy that luxury. I, I, I find it a gift from God. Being a non-denominational church 
is really happening for me right now. Let me explain. I could talk about things in the Bible because they're in the Bible. I don't have a set prescription of what we can't talk about in the Bible because some headquarters in some city has defined what I can and cannot talk about. This is community Bible church. So what I'm about to share with you, you will not hear elsewhere because it is forbidden in some circles. But what I'm gonna share with you now, you will hear elsewhere and probably shouldn't because it's abused. So I love the fact I'm in a church where you can talk about the Bible. A lot of ministers do not talk about what I'm about to talk about because of political reasons, because of theological limitations. Many ministers experience what I'm about to talk about and still don't share it with people for financial reasons. It's a fascinating subject. And it has to do with the word flow. Out of you will flow rivers of living water. What am I referring to? God wants to fill you with love, power, peace, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. To the extent that you are going to give that away and it doesn't become a flood in your life. God is not looking at filling his people with his spirit that they may create a flood that goes nowhere, has no boundary, no direction, no purpose, and no mission. He is not into that. In the first century Jerusalem, it was called Pentecost. In 1906, it was the result of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Topeka, Kansas, and Azusa Street, Los Angeles. It has affected 600 million people to date. God filling his people with his spirit as we see in Pentecost. What is that? What is that? What is that? Is that a river? Out of you will flow rivers of living water. Is that a river of life? Yeah, wherever the church went, there was what? Life. Conversion, 3,000 the first day, where the spirit of God was in a human being who would willingly give that power away. There was healing, there was life, there was wisdom, there was clarity, there was conversion, there was churches, there was teaching, there was agreement, there was power, there was sharing of food, there was devotion to the word, there was boldness, there was joy, there was laughter. A church that is willing to receive and temporarily hold on to but have a mission to give away and flow like a river will be power in the last days. Flow, F-L-O-W. God fills people with his spirit who understand flow and understand friendship. The power of the Holy Spirit saturating a human life that does not understand friendship is a problem. It restricts the flow. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. You're gonna know what I'm doing, and I'm gonna know what you're doing, and we're gonna converse about it because we have a friendship. If you don't have a friendship with God, his spirit will not flow through you. It is not an irreverent friendship. It is not a casual friendship. It is a friendship of openness and sharing, intimacy, transparency, the sharing of secrets, close, close friendship. A close, close friend of God is one in whom the Spirit flows into other people's lives. The second thing that is a, an essential to the flow of the Holy Spirit in a person, in a family, in a church is lordship. Lordship is 
different than friendship in, in that the friendship never eclipses the boundaries of the fear of God, the reverence for God, the, the deity, the majesty, the nobility of God. The com- here you go, the commands of God. The commands of God are not up for negotiation to the friend of God. There is a deep love in friendship, and that deep love in friendship translates to a deep obedience in lordship. And they're both necessary. The absence of friendship and lordship in your life could be the presence of the making of a pretty Mac Daddy spiritual flood. And if you find yourself seemingly going nowhere, just kind of sitting out there baking in the sun as flies accumulate above you and mud beneath you. If that's where you are in your spiritual walk, you need, I need, we both need friendship with God that comes by way of conversation and time and lordship and obedience that comes from love. We, Jesus says, you obey me because you love me. The next thing that is an essential for the flow of power through a person's life is ownership. A lack of clarity on who owns you is a problem. A lack of clarity on what I think I own that really belongs to God, that's a problem too. If I think I own my life and I exist for my own good pleasure and what I deem necessary, and I'm, if I'm the king on the chessboard instead of the pawn, I'm restricting flow of power out of my life and other people's lives. If my money and my wife's money and our bank account we think is ours, we don't understand the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Ownership, I own nothing. I own a house with a mortgage, I don't, really owe the bank, I owe the Lord, he owns the bank. The people at the bank work for God. I owe God money to pay off his house that he's letting me stay in. Because I don't have a landlord, he's the Lord of the land, ownership. Flow, friendship, lordship, ownership. And if you can find a place, what does it matter, Paul said, what does it matter? Here I am in this rotty, dungy, dirty, stinking prison. What does it matter? He was in a prison in Philippi when the earthquake came. Now he's writing to the church in Philippi from a prison. What does it matter? Um, You know what he's doing in that prison in Philippi in the middle of the night? Worshiping. A person who lives a life of worship who owns nothing but exists to please God, who reveres his name, yet can approach him boldly and come to the throne of grace, that can have an intimate friendship, is a vessel that God wants to fill with the power of his spirit. Call it Pentecost, call it being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Who cares what you call it? Let's just call it reality in our own life. That's all I care about. That's the person who's a river, and out of him flow rivers of living water.